Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is Station. I am ready for the event. Houston ACR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? Houston ACR, this is Station. I have you loud and clear. All righty, please stand by for opening remarks. As we say in the Choctaw Nation, Halito, or hello. I'm Gary Batten, Chief of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. The Choctaw Nation, the third largest federally recognized tribe, resides in southeastern Oklahoma and is the second largest reservation in the United States, which is about the size of the state of Vermont. This is a wonderful opportunity for students and tribal members to interact with astronauts aboard the International Space Station. Now here is our first question. Hi, my name is Avery, and I was wondering if you can do surgery in space. Hi, Avery. So we have a lot of medical equipment in space to take care of astronauts if we get hurt. And we get a fair amount of training for uh, minor conditions and a couple major conditions. Sometimes we're fortunate enough, like on this expedition, to have a doctor with us. But if we need help from somebody on the ground, then we can talk to them. And we have medical kits such as these, which are filled with all types of different equipment to help us breathe, to keep our bodies uh, safe and to do some minor procedures. But if we have something really go wrong on board station, then we have uh, the spacecraft that we came up on and we could um, go into that spacecraft and do an emergency undock to get the astronauts back home safely. Hi, my name is Tesca Roberts and can you describe what it feels like when you take off? When you launch on top of a rocket from Earth into space, it is the most incredible feeling. So you're laying on your back when you launch, and you can feel the prop being loaded on the spacecraft and the rocket. It kind of feels like it comes alive. And then you hear the countdown, and when it gets to zero, you have actually a pretty smooth acceleration, and you can feel the additional forces of gravity come through your chest. That force grows to about four and a half times the force of gravity that you feel on Earth. So you feel it pushing down on your chest. You really have to concentrate in order to breathe and inflate your lungs. And you actually feel the tongue kind of fall back into the back of your throat. As you get faster and faster, you can feel the rocket and the spacecraft start to shake and start to rumble. And you can really feel the power of the engines beneath you. And then when the engines finally cut off, it's instantaneous, boom and it's totally silent and totally smooth and you're floating and you know you've made it into space. It's absolutely incredible. Hi, my name's Caden and I was wondering if you can lift unlimited weight in space. In space, we have unlimited strength. Well, so we're in microgravity and so things have mass but they don't have weight like they do on Earth. And so I could lift something that's 500 pounds and I could lift it up with ease with my hand. Now, I need to use force in order to stop the momentum of that object. And so if it's very heavy or if it's moving very fast, then that'll have to increase the amount of force that I need to stop that object from moving. Um, so it's very interesting. You can tell when things are heavy because they have, you can feel that mass and that momentum in space. But as far as lifting something, um, I was carrying a bag on a spacewalk the other day and it was 330 pounds. And um, other than it having mass, you couldn't tell that it weighed that much. Hi, my name is Deanne and my question is, how do you wash your spaces? Hi, Deandra. So unfortunately, no washing of uh, clothes or spacesuits or really anything while we're up in space. We don't have washing machines and no showers because water behaves very differently in space. And so this is a bag of water that I have here. And I'll show you, in, in, on Earth, if I squirted water out of a bag, it would just fall to the ground. 
But in space, since there's no gravity, when I squirt the water out, you can see it just forms this kind of a big bubble here in space. And that just floats around. So you can put this water onto a towel, and then you can use that to kind of wash your body. Or when we get back from a spacewalk, we have um, some wet wipes and sanitation wipes that we can use to clean the inside of a spacesuit. Um, but you don't wash it traditionally like you do on Earth. Hi, my name is Caleb Anthony, and my question is, how do you think space exploration and NASA will advance in the coming years? Caleb, this is an incredibly exciting time for human exploration. You're seeing a lot of activity in low Earth orbit, not just from NASA and our international partners, but also from commercial industry. So we have private astronauts now that fly to the International Space Station, and also private astronauts that fly and do missions in low Earth orbit um, on a SpaceX spacecraft. And so you're gonna see, I think, the transition of low Earth orbit really to more commercial companies, maybe smaller space stations uh, that are in low Earth orbit conducting science. And you're also gonna see us expand and explore into deep space. We already have the Artemis program. And last month we sent Orion out beyond the moon, farther than we have sent any human rated spacecraft before. And soon you're gonna see humans launch to the moon. Our aim is to have sustained human presence on the lunar surface. And really, this is a stepping stone for our exploration in the future to Mars. So you'll see a lot of changes and a lot of increase in our exploration into deep space. Hello, my name is Scarlett Cohus. And I want to know about space to strong muscle smooth gravity. Hi, Scarlett. So, as I was saying, when you're in space, if something is heavy, you don't need necessarily strong muscles to lift it up. But it's very important that astronauts keep their strong muscles in space for a couple reasons. One is you're really just floating around all day. And so if I didn't work out and exercise my muscles, I would have what's called muscle atrophy and all the strength in my muscles would go away. And then when I return to earth, I wouldn't be strong enough to even support the weight of my own body to stand up and, and hold my head up. So we have different devices on board the space station to help us exercise and to keep our muscles strong. Also, when we go outside the space station on a spacewalk, we're wearing a huge spacesuit, and that is inflated to 4.3 psi above the vacuum of space. And to operate that spacesuit, you need strong muscles to work against the force of the spacesuit and to crawl along the space station and stop and start your momentum as you're going. So it's very important that we keep our strong muscles while we're in space. Hi, my name is Avery. I have a question. Is it quiet in space? So Avery, if you were outside in the vacuum of space, it would be absolutely quiet. But inside the International Space Station, it's actually quite loud. I'm not sure if you could hear some of the background noise here. I'm in the US lab right now, and you can see there's a ton of computer systems and cabling and science experiments everywhere. All those systems run off of processors that require cooling, and so there's a lot of fans. And a lot of the science experiments have different gases and different um, mechanics that will run and those are actually quite loud so there is a bit of a hum all throughout the International Space Station 24 hours a day and seven days a week. My name is Cameron I was wondering does the temperature change when the Sun is blocked by the Earth since there's no atmosphere in space? So you're right, because there's no atmosphere in space, you're not gonna have the temperature of air like you do on Earth. However, things outside the space station, when they're in direct sunlight, will certainly heat up. And those will heat up to about 248 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's much more than the temperature of boiling water. 
And when things are in a shade or in a shadow or on the backside of the earth, then things will cool down to about minus 148 degrees Fahrenheit. So the fluctuation of temperature of the, of the objects outside the space station is quite large. Hi, my name is Hannah, and I would like to know how electricity works in the International Space Station. Hi, Hannah. So we have four pairs of solar arrays, and these are huge arrays that extend into space, and they collect the energy from the sun. These arrays then take that energy and store it into batteries. So when the space station is in direct sunlight, we're absorbing energy from the sun, and when we're in shadow or in eclipse, then we use the energy that's been stored in the batteries to power all of the lights, all the computer systems, and all the fans on board the space station. We're actually upgrading some of these solar arrays because many of them have been functional for over 20 years. And that's part of the spacewalks that we've been doing over the past few months. And in fact, this Thursday, my crewmate Koichi and I will go outside the space station to set up a mod kit that will house a new solar array called an IROSA that will be rolled out to collect even more energy from the sun. Hi, my name is Colt Koshat, and my question is, does the gravity make it more comfortable on your body in space than on Earth? I don't know if you could say it's more comfortable. Things are definitely different. And so when you're in space, you have what's called a fluid shift. So normally all the blood, a lot of blood would uh, be in your legs, but because you're in space and there's no gravity, a lot of that blood and fluid will shift up uh, towards your face. So you can see your face is a little bit puffier, your arms feel like a little bit puffier. You may feel a little bit congested when you first get up here, but it's not uncomfortable. Some of the nice things are that your back doesn't have all that force of your weight all the time when you're on earth and your knees from walking around. So if you have maybe like a nagging knee or a back injury, that doesn't hurt you as much in space. So kind of some of those aches and pains actually go away. But it is quite comfortable uh, living and operating in microgravity. My name is Noah and how to be an astronaut. Hi, Noah. There are many different ways to becoming an astronaut. Uh, the first one is you need to have a master's degree in a field of science, technology, engineering, or math. And then beyond that, really just some experience in whatever your job is. And so people that are astronauts, some are military fighter pilots, others are doctors, scientists, engineers, and teachers. And so there are many different paths to becoming an astronaut, but it's important that you follow your passions in life and that you do well in school and that you take care of your body. And if that's something that you're interested in when you grow up, you should certainly apply. Hi, my name is Kylie, and I would like to know what your most important job is while you're on duty. The most important new job you have while you're on duty is the thing you're doing right at that moment. There's a lot of critical operations that we conduct on board the International Space Station. And then even some operations that you think, oh, maybe this isn't that important or that critical, really are because you're the only person up here and it's your job to make sure that you have that operation done just right. So whether I'm conducting a million dollar science experiment or I'm fixing the toilet, or I'm preparing to go outside and execute a spacewalk, or I'm talking to kids like you and sharing our mission from space. Whatever you're doing at that time is the most important. So it's really, we focus on staying focused and getting that job done. And then when you're done with that job, now you can then divert your attention and your energy to the next task. My name is Cash. Uh how is your sleep cycle affected in space? Cash, 
So I actually sleep pretty well in space. I think most astronauts do. Uh, you don't have a bed like you're used to back on Earth because there's no gravity. And so you have a little room that's called your crew quarters. It's about the size of a large telephone booth and uh, you have a sleeping bag. And so what I like to do is I take a bungee cord and I just Velcro myself to the wall and that just keeps me from floating around too much and, and bonking my head into the ceiling. Um, and then you just kind of float in space like this and sleep. And it's actually quite comfortable. Uh, because you don't have the sunrise and the sunset, it can affect your circadian rhythm. So we have lights around the space station that we can change. Um, and so when it's getting close to the evening time, you can change those lights to give your body the same kind of cues that you would have on Earth with the sun setting and some of that bright light going away into darkness. Hi, my name is Savannah, and I was wondering why you don't use the methane gas generated by the Sabatier system for fuel. So currently on board, we don't have any hardware that uses methane gas as a supply. The Sabatier is a technology demonstration, and so it's trying to develop and understand how we can create life support systems that are self-contained. And in fact, we have advanced systems that will be coming up after Sabatier to try to improve that technology to make it more efficient and to also make it smaller. And so we can use that on board the space station and potentially for uh, spacecraft that explore into deep space and perhaps from applications back on planet Earth. Hi, my name is Riley and I was wondering if the air in the International Space Station is humid or dry and why? Uh, so we control the air in the International Space Station to keep our bodies comfortable and also to keep all the electronics that we have on board cool and operating at the correct temperatures. So there's a lot of fans that are moving air around. We have essentially air conditioning systems that will scrub the humidity out of the air and also control the temperature. So right now it's set to about 72% and the humidity is quite low. So that keeps it comfortable and it's also good for all the computer equipment on board the space station. Hey, my name is Sequoia Johnson and my question is what are you doing on your mission? Well, our mission is about five to six months long, and we have over 200 science experiments that we're conducting inside and outside of the space station. We're executing spacewalks to upgrade those solar arrays on the outside of the space station. In fact, today, my crewmate Josh installed this really cool science experiment called the Biofabrication Facility. This is a facility that is literally printing, 3D printing human cells. So it first flew back in 2019, and it was able to print the knee meniscus and also some human heart cells. And we learned a lot from that experiment. It was flown back down to Earth. Some upgrades and modifications were made, and then it just flew again, and we installed it today. So again, we're looking at printing these human cells and trying to determine if we can print them at a better quality than you can on planet Earth because you don't have the effects of gravity. The aim eventually is to then be able to print human organs. And in fact, they're looking to do trials in animals within the decade. So it's very exciting science. Hi, my name is Bethany. Um, if you're orbiting Earth, how do you know which way is north, east, south, and west? And how do you tell? So while you're inside the space station, you really can't tell if you're upside down or on the wall. It really feels the same to your body. There's, there's no difference at all. And so generally, we use all the ceiling, the walls, the floor, everything of the space station. Uh, but we have labels um, that are written as if you were on the deck of the space station. And that helps you kind of orient yourself if you're trying to do uh, some type of activity. And so you'll see a lot of the things are situated like you're on the deck and looking forward. But to your body, it doesn't matter. Now, as far as relative to Earth, 
Really, you can look at um, our navigation systems or look out the window. We have a module called the cupola, which has seven windows that are pointed down towards Earth. And so you can look out and you can see planet Earth, and then you can uh, look at geography to tell which way is north, south, east, and west. Hi, my name's Hayston, and I was just wondering, when the space station goes out of orbit and you start losing gravity's pull, at what rate do you lose it and at about what altitude? So really, it's dependent on your altitude above Earth. And so we are about 250 miles above the planet and we're traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. And that is the correct speed in order to keep us in orbit. Now there is a little bit of atmosphere and a little bit of drag, so we are continuously decreasing that altitude. But we do what's called a reboost, where we fire the uh, thrusters um, to boost the altitude of the International Space Station. You can think of it kind of like a good analogy is if we shot a cannon, say from the top of a hill. The faster the velocity of that cannonball, the farther that it would go. And eventually, if you're shooting that canyon, that uh, cannonball fast enough, as it falls towards Earth, the curvature of the Earth is going to match that cannonball and it will continue to go around. So we are actually always continuously falling back towards Earth. We're just happening to do it at the same rate as the Earth's curves, and that's what keeps us in orbit. This has been an amazing opportunity for students and tribal members to get a firsthand look at what scientists, physicians, and educators do in space and inspire the next generation of students to pursue STEM careers. We are excited for this opportunity for our students and the future of STEM. Thank you, or Yako Ki, and God bless. Thank you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.